Good morning. I have been thinking a lot about you. Yes, I've been warned. This is going to be a smart crowd. <laughs> uh, first, I want to thank Peggy for that beautiful introduction. And she's been minding me since yesterday. And we writers are like cats. So hurting us is not easy. <laughs> So thank you so much, Peggy, for your time, your generosity, your thoughtfulness. I also want to thank Nora, because she's doing a lot of heavy lifting. We wouldn't be here without her, really. And <laughs> and where's Judy? Judy Wilson, where are you? Oh, Judy, I want to thank you for all the work that you've done. Now, yesterday night, none of us, not all of you were here, but we had the pleasure of meeting the committees that do all this work in order for us to be here. And what I did not know is that there was actually kind of like a beauty contest going on <laughs> where they had to read 50 books. Was it 50? About 50 books? About that, About that much. And I didn't know that there was a, like a very heated discussion of who would make the cut and who would not. <laughs> so I just want you to know, like, We did it. <laughs> so thank you, Judy, and thank you to all the readers. I'm actually going to judge the National Book Award this year for fiction. And we were told that we have to read 350 books. So I'm going to ask Judy what the secret is, because <laughs> I am absolutely terrified. The books have started to come into the house, and I'm thinking, I might have to move. <laughs> Also, I've been thinking a lot about you and how you and I are connected. You and I are connected because you are supporting the arts. You are volunteering. You are doing a lot of work for free. And you give of yourselves and your time. And you sacrifice your lives, not just for the pleasure of yourself, but for others. And writers, especially fiction writers, most of us work on spec, which means that we are constantly trying to make things although no one asked us to. <laughs> so why would we volunteer our energies, our anxieties, and our time in order to write something? We must be crazy. All of us. But I want to tell you why you guys are all nuts and why we're nuts. And it's because we're Americans. So when I was living in Japan from 2007 to 2011, I volunteered at a soup kitchen where we fed Japanese homeless people. And the Japanese homeless are really different from homeless populations that in America. And for example, they're incredibly clean because they have public baths in Japan. And, but one of the things that was really important to me in my experience was that nearly all of the volunteers were American. And this made me really think about things. And very often, you'd have these Japanese men, and they're almost always Japanese men who were the homeless who came to the curry kitchen. They would be wearing golf shirts. They would have things like Whistling Creek Country Club. <laughs> Why would that be? <laughs> I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> it would be because Americans had donated their clothes. Americans had raised the money to feed the Japanese homeless. And I don't know how much you know this, but all over the world, people don't necessarily always think you have to help people who are outside of your interests or outside of your tribes. And I was an American history major, so I do know the long history of American volunteerism. And American volunteerism is something that was really important for the entire nation that comes out of a Judeo-Christian history of sharing and of charity. So I want to commend all of you for helping artists to make things. Thank you very much. I thought I would share with you some very strange facts about my life. So when I was in high school, I learned, and this is about three decades ago, I'm going to turn 50 this year. 
I know it's hard to believe, isn't it? <laughs> At any point, if you want to tell me I look younger, I'm happy to <laughs> take your praise. <laughs> I can't believe I'm going to be 50. And it's kind of cool because you're not old, but you're not young, and you kind of like want to have your shit together. So I think a 50 is a good thing. Um, there were two things that happened when I was in high school almost three decades ago. And the first thing that happened was that I fell in love with an author named Sinclair Lewis. Now that's weird because I was a Korean American kid. And why in the world would I fall in love with an author named Sinclair Lewis? And he is known primarily for writing a book called Main Street as well as Babbitt. And recently a very important book called It Can't Happen Here in which a fascist leader gets elected. His Amazon ranking went up <laughs> recently, and I don't know why. Secondly, I donated blood to the American Red Cross, and the American Red Cross wrote back to me, and they said, please never give blood again. Because I carried an illness in my body, I was a chronic hepatitis B carrier, and I was asymptomatic. However, I had in my body a disease that could be communicated by blood, through sex, and through childbirth. About Sinclair Lewis. <laughs> so he was a doctor's third son. He is a native son of Minnesota. He was incredibly tall and skinny, and he had terrible acne. And apparently he was very socially awkward and he didn't have any friends. So of course I identified with him. <laughs> and he went to Yale, so I wanted to go to Yale. And I applied and somehow they took me. And when I got there, and I think all the writers here who are so tremendous can certify that we are all slightly magical thinkers, not the most rational group. That would be the nonfiction writers. <laughs> I somehow thought that if I went to New Haven, like Sinclair Lewis would be there. <laughs> he was not. He had graduated in 1908. So even though I chose a college based on a writer that I really loved, and even though I was crazy about reading, it never occurred to me that I would be a writer, like ever. And I thought that I should major in economics because I grew up in a working class background and I thought that it was a good thing to do for my parents because they had worked for all their lives while they're in this country in a teeny tiny store that's about half the size of this stage. And that's the ring of truth. <laughs> and in this little state, like, it was about, yeah, about two thirds of this stage, but in one length. And it was in Midtown Manhattan, which is now called Koreatown, but they came before it became really Koreatown. And they sold costume jewelry to peddlers, to street peddlers. And the rent was exorbitant, but the actual space itself was really disgusting. And my sisters and I, I have two sisters, we would go work there on the weekends and we would work during holidays. And we would be really terrified of going to work there, not because the work was bad, the work was fine, but because if you went to the bathroom, it was in the basement, and in the basement there were all these enormous rats. Yeah, and to this day, if you want to freak me out, <laughs> show me a rat. So my younger sister and I, we would hold hands on Saturday morning, we'd go to work to help mom and dad, and we'd go downstairs to the basement, and of course, like, the rat would be there, or the rats would be there, and we would go like this, like that. And the rats would be like, This is my house. <laughs> so anyway, I thought I would major in economics. But then I took macroeconomics my freshman year. 
And then I learned that you have to know how to read graphs. <laughs> so I decided to major in history. <laughs> because history is just a collection of true stories. And, well, why did it never occur to me to be a writer? And the longer I stayed there, I think it's because I wasn't really like Sinclair Lewis. And I thought to myself, how could I love writing so much and reading so much, but if I'm not a person like Sinclair Lewis, that means that I'm out of the game. And then I met all these English majors. I thought maybe I should major in English. But then they had such great hair. <laughs> and the most beautiful clothes. And they had these super long eyelashes. And I was like, well, that, I'm out. <laughs> and then I took a Asian American literature class because I thought, well, maybe it's possible for Asian American people to be writers. Um, and then when I took the class, I read two books by Korean American women who had written books. And the first book that I read was by Teresa Hakyung Cha, and it's a book called Dicte. It's kind of an experimental novel, incredibly avant-garde, and it's one of those books where they have events at like MoMA because it's so out there. <laughs> and I definitely didn't understand it when I read it. I get it now, but back then I was like, whoa, why? Anyway, so, and then I did a little research on her, and this is before Google, when you could just type a name and all of a sudden, like, you know their social security number? <laughs> and it turned out, because I did library research where you had to go somewhere and like look at some book, and she had been violently murdered. I know, it was terrible. And she, right after she published her book in 1982, she was violently murdered. And then I read another book by Kim Run Young, and the book is called Clay Walls. And it's a great book. It's a historical novel, incredibly amazing. It's so amazing in so many ways. And I read it. And then in 1985, right after she published the book, she died of cancer. I say it in history. <laughs> so the second thing that I learned about myself was the fact that I was an asymptomatic chronic hepatitis B carrier. And in high school, I was asymptomatic, so I didn't show any reason why I was sick. I just knew that I had this thing, so if I had a child or if I had a sex partner, I would have to you know, exactly say all these things. And that's kind of a heavy sentence. But I thought, okay, well, I feel okay. And then one day I got really, really sick. I got incredibly sick. And then I went to the doctor, and my parents couldn't come because they were working. And I went to Yale New Haven Hospital. And Dr. Rubin said to me, well, it's because you are now symptomatic. And when you are in your 20s or your 30s, you're going to get liver cancer. And you will not be a candidate for a transplant because if you are a carrier, you're not top of the line. And it's an incredibly difficult organ to go get. So I remember it sitting there like as he's talking. And I don't know if you guys ever get sick and you're talking to the doctor, but the news is so intense. Like you're, like, it's like the peanuts. Like it's like, nah, 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 nah. and like, like, I just couldn't, I couldn't quite compute. And I remember thinking, the only thing I really thought at that moment was, I have to be careful of my time. So right before I graduated in, from college, I went to a lecture that an American missionary was being featured. And he had worked with the Koreans in Japan. And I only went because I think I was the only kid in college who went to church. <laughs> and the university chaplain always really felt sorry for me because I would be sitting there in the pew, like by myself. And he was always really nice to me. This is Reverend Harry Adams. And one day, um, Reverend Adams said, we're having this talk, can you go? And I was like, okay. So I went, and it was me, one other sucker, <laughs> a 
the university chaplain and the speaker. <laughs> you can't leave. <laughs> so I sat there and you know, I don't know if you know this about me, but there's a huge plate of cookies. And I can do a lot for a plate of cookies. So I figured it's 45 minutes, how bad can it be? So I sat there, and this American missionary, he's like this you know, nice white guy who works in Japan, he's really well-intentioned, and as you can imagine, he's a good person. And he's talking, talking, talking about the history of Koreans in Japan. I knew nothing about it, because you know, even as a history major, I knew nothing about this. And then, I was kind of slightly paying attention, but not really. I was thinking more about this boyfriend that I had, <laughs> and how he was such a jerk. <laughs> My own private oppression. So, I, you know, he's talking, and then finally he mentions this story about a young boy who's 13 years old, who's Korean Japanese, who's in his parish. And he said the 13-year-old boy had climbed up to his apartment building and then he jumped off to his death. And his parents were devastated because this boy no, showed no signs of anything wrong. So the parents, who were also born in Japan, who were ethnically Korean, went through all of his materials and they found his middle school yearbook. And in the middle school yearbook, they had found that his Japanese classmates, who were also 13, had written, go back to where you belong, I hate you, you smell like kimchi. And they wrote the words, die, die, die. And that moment changed my life. That story burned into my brain. I was 19 years old. I, w I knew that I was a history major and I did graduate and I went to law school because I'm an immigrant. And I worked as a lawyer and I got a job and I found a husband. Not easy. <laughs> um, and I practiced law for two years in New York City. And while I was practicing, I thought, wow, this is amazing. I get to work in this beautiful, fancy building and it smells clean all the time. And the toilets have really well-stocked paper towels and how can I possibly complain about how hard the work is? And then one day, I billed 300 hours, which is for a month. Now, I used to think that was urban legend. But I thought it was probably a man who was probably lying about all those hours. And then I did it. And I realized, holy shit, this is so hard. And I was really also aware of my time. Like, how much time do I have? So one day, I go to my partner's office, and I was a good little lawyer, because I'm really neurotic. And I had done all my work, so I was the kind of kid baby lawyer that partners love to task on deals, because I would actually read every document. And then find the you know, smoking gun and go like, ah, <laughs> here's how we're gonna save our really important corporation, $100,000. Like, I would really care. So, I had finished this big due diligence report. I was really proud of myself. And I go to the partner's office, and I'm so freaking tired, it's crazy. And the partner said, that's great, and here's your new matter. Like, another deal. And I just said, I quit. Like, I can't do this anymore. And this is like, I hadn't told anybody. My husband and I had a little mortgage for an apartment. <laughs> we had exactly $15,000 saved in our banking account. And I thought, well, that's a lot of money. It's going to last us a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I know, isn't that sweet? <laughs> Like, such a moron. <laughs> like, you can obviously see I should never have been an economics major. 
I will quit this job as a corporate lawyer where I was making $83,000 a year and I had beautiful clothes and I had a clean bathroom to go every day. And I thought, $15,000, we're going to be good. I'm going to write a book and I'm going to be able to restore that income immediately. I was wrong. I wrote a novel right after I quit being a lawyer, and it was called Revival of the Senses. And it was as pretentious as it sounds. <laughs> and every publisher in New York City turned it down on really nice paper. <laughs> like, this was when your agent would send you your rejections on the paper themselves, and now, you know, you just, your, your agent will kindly say, um, they passed. <laughs> but absolutely everybody turned it down, and there wasn't really a kind, encouraging note. And then so I sat down and I wrote another book, and it was called Motherland, and it was from 1996 to 2003, and it was about the Koreans in Japan, and I did a shitload of research, and I wrote this thing, and after I finished writing it, I looked at it, I read it, and I realized, wow, it's so boring. <laughs> because my wheelhouse is 19th century literature, and I know how you can have a really great idea and you can have beautiful writing and it has to work together. And right now, what I had were a lot of facts on four or 500 pages. So then I got really depressed. I thought, okay, you're, this is not, you've made a terrible mistake. Like, you have ruined your life. And what are you gonna do now? And all these voices are going on in my head. And then also, I was really ill. So in 1998, uh, we had our son, Sam, who's now 20. And I suffer from all these joint problems, so I couldn't hold a coffee cup by the handle, I couldn't open a doorknob, I couldn't go up the stairs, and I had all these different doctors telling me I had MS, I had this, I had that. And then finally, the hepatologist said, you have liver cirrhosis. So Dr. Rubin had been right, so I was getting really sick. And then, he said, you're a young mother, and you should try this experimental drug called interferon B. So I did, and I was way sicker using the drug than with my symptoms of liver cirrhosis, and I lost my hair, I threw up all the time, I had diarrhea and I couldn't leave the house, and if I bent down to pick up something, the, the blood vessels in my face would break. But the drug worked and I'm totally cured now. America is a great country. And all that medication we were able to afford with like a $25 copay per month because we had health insurance. And my doctor, Dr. McGunn, who wears bow ties, He's very thoughtful, very skeptical man, very measured. He said it was a miracle. It was an absolute miracle that somehow I had survived and that I'm totally clean of hepatitis B as a chronic carrier. And from 1995 to the year that I quit being a lawyer, I was taking a lot of classes. And the classes by classes, I mean, it's like one night a week, like in a community center, taught by a really amazing writer, because in New York City, you can have incredible writers for a song. Like maybe like $200, and you can take 12 classes, um, two hours or something like that a week. And I was taking all these different classes. And at places that aren't considered respectable, I don't have an MFA, so I took classes at the Y, the Asian American Writers Center, the Gotham Writers Workshop, where they have classes that are from pamphlets. And I had a binder filled with rejections from all these different stories, and it was about three inches thick. And I thought about bringing that to you today. <laughs> but they charge you when you check a bag. <laughs> so I did not. <laughs> but remember, I was somebody who loved Sinclair Lewis when I was in high school. So the thing that I knew that even maybe if I wasn't a good writer, 
that at least I could be a really great reader. And I am a fantastic reader. Like, I have amazing literary taste. <laughs> you probably do too. <laughs> and I read a book by V.S. Naipaul called A House for Mr. Biswas. And that book kicks ass. It's so great. Now, V.S. Naipaul, I want to just warn you, and I know this is being recorded, but most likely V.S. Naipaul will not see this. I mean, who knows? Um, he's not a nice man. He doesn't like women. He doesn't like people of color. But he wrote a beautiful novel. And I read this novel on the subway, and when I finished it, I burst into tears in front of everybody. And it occurred to me that Naipaul had had the courage to write about the people that he knew, that he admired, and he wrote about his neighborhood. And I thought, okay, I'm going to write about Elmhurst, Queens. And I did, and that novel became Free Food for Millionaires, my first novel, and that was published in 2007. So it took me 12 years to publish my first book. Um, I'm a very fast writer. <laughs> and that book is about money and class and ambition, but mostly it's about failure and how the conventional ideas about money and class ambition don't hold up for people who are outsiders. And then after I published the book, my husband got a job in Japan, and he said, we have to go, we need the money, and I didn't want to go, but it was not easy to find a new husband. <laughs> so I went. But I was grumbling the whole time. And I was whiny, and I was pissed. I was like, why do I have to live in this country? Like, it's a great place to visit, but I don't want to live here. I miss my friends and my family, and I felt like I just published a book, and I can't promote it at all. Ah, anyway, I don't have a very grateful heart. <laughs> I think about this all the time. But in Japan, I was able to return to that manuscript called Motherland, and I thought, you know, since I'm here anyway, and we have housing, and my son's tuition is paid, I am going to interview all these Korean Japanese people and figure out what went wrong with that book. So I did. And then after I met dozens and dozens of Korean Japanese, and after I went to Osaka and I did all this field work where pachinko parlors were and where all these people were working and how they had lived for almost 100 years, it occurred to me, I had no idea what I was doing. And that's really great. So I realized that the Korean Japanese do not in any way see themselves as victims, whereas I had. Because I had read the anthropology, history, sociology, immigration law, I had read everything. And some of those authors, um, the scholars are written at the back of the book because I wanted to acknowledge the very important work that they had done. And I learned that, oh, my first book was all about victimhood and about being correct and about being angry at people who had hurt the Korean Japanese because I was really angry. And then I realized I'm wrong. So I had to take the entire book and throw it away and start all over again. So Pachinko, the book that I'm here to represent is really, for me, the solution of why people hate and why people can respond to hatred and what can we do about the fact that this hatred and discrimination persists even today. So I have failed now for way more years, way more many years than I have succeeded if I have succeeded at all. And just recently, I was rejected for four fellowships, um, two teaching positions, an editor position. And I mention this because I'm trying to understand what makes us keep going. Like, besides the fact that we have mental health issues. <laughs> I was thinking about you. I was thinking about what makes you keep going. And I thought that in order to be useful, 
I want to tell you about your superpower. Because you have a superpower. And you use it all the time. So how do you persist? How do you keep going? Well, perhaps you're a parent. And maybe your teenager has hurt your feeling again. And yet you wait up for him very right late at night when you're bone tired. Perhaps you have an ailing parent and they call you again and say, can you take me to the doctor? But they don't ask very nicely. And you still take time off from your work to go. You meet one more homeless person who needs money. And somehow you open your purse and you hand out a dollar. And you're tired and you just don't know how else you're going to solve these problems. Your country strikes Syria. And you see these images of children with foam coming out of their mouths. How do we persist? We have to remember that we can love in a very difficult situation. And we love every single day, even when it's really, really difficult. And that is our superpower. So I want to thank you for all of your love. I want to thank you for persisting. Because really, we cannot continue until we witness to each other how much we persist. So thank you.